Fut homis is a deo, cui nomen erat Ioannis. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Although there were a great number of uh, sources used in preparing this sermon, uh, far too many to cite, the bulk of the credit is due to the brilliant work of Don and Moksar. As the past few decades have made clear to anyone with eyes to see, there's been an alarming Islamic expansion into Europe. Last month in Budapest, on the feast of St. Stephen of Hungary, there they celebrate his feast day on August 20th, there was a mass and procession. In his sermon, which was broadcast on state radio on the state television network, Bishop of Gyor spoke of the current situation and asked his faithful, why do the Muslims come to Europe? And why can they take over Europe? Why do they now do what they could not do 500 years ago? Why? Because the Catholic people have lost their faith. How can we defend Europe without the faith? was not always this way. On August 6th, 1682, the Ottoman Empire declared war on the Holy Roman Empire. Kara Mustafa, the Grand Vizier of the Turks, bragged that after the fall of Vienna, he would stable his horses in St. Peter's Basilica. Sultan Mehmed IV sent notice of his decision to Leopold I, the Holy Roman Emperor. Quote, We will destroy your little country with our army. Above all, we order you to await us in your residence city of Vienna so we can decapitate you. We will exterminate you and all your followers. Children and grown-ups will be exposed to the most atrocious tortures before being put to end in the most vicious way imaginable. Your little empire I will take from you and its entire population, I will sweep off the earth. Close quote. The sultan followed with another cheery note in February of 1683, reading in part, quote, For I declare unto you, I will make myself your master, pursue you from east to west, and trample under feet with my horses all that is acceptable and pleasant in your eyes. For I have resolved to ruin both you and your people and to leave in the empire a commemoration of my most dreadful sword. It will be a pleasure to me to publicly establish my religion and to pursue your crucified God, whose wrath I fear not, nor do I fear his coming to your assistance to deliver you out of my hands. I will, according to my pleasure, put your sacred priest to the plow and do some things to your Catholic women, which I will not repeat here. Forsake your religion, or else I will give order to consume you with fire. Close quote. Sultan Mehmed IV, 20 February 1683. In the face of the Muslim peril, Emperor Leopold turned for counsel to the apostolic nuncio and papal legate, a Capuchin priest and a miracle worker named Blessed Marco de Avignon. Blessed Marco told the emperor, quote, God is armed with scourges because he has been provoked by our sins. We should appease him by humiliations, repentance, and self-denial. Then when our hearts have turned back to God, and when in reparation for the public offenses that are committed against him, we shall have rendered to him the public homage which is due. I am certain that God, though he send affliction, will not will our desolation. Close quote. Then Blessed Marco turned to the Viennese and warned them, quote, Vienna, Vienna, your love of lax living has prepared for you a grave and eminent chastisement. Convert and consider well what you are doing, O wretched Vienna. Close quote. The emperor heeded the warnings, commanded public penances, and the Viennese responded with penance, 
prayer and public devotions to Our Lady, help of Christians. From Rome, Blessed Pope Innocent XI called on all Catholic rulers to unite against the Turk and began sending out papal nuncios throughout Europe to promote the Catholic cause and join the Holy Roman Emperor in the war effort. He spent Lent in prayer and penance for the cause and ordered that the votive prayer against the infidels be said at every Mass. King Louis XIV, for his part, worked very hard to undermine the papal efforts. Louis XIV, the very same king who refused to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart in spite of the specific request delivered to him by St. Margaret Mary from our Lord, Louis XIV declined to obey the Pope and, in fact, had already assured the Turks of his neutrality in the case of war. Jan Sobieski, the King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania, was prepared to answer the Pope's call, but in order to go to war, Polish law required him to get a unanimous approval of the Polish Diet, the Polish legislature. The French ambassador used all the slippery diplomacy possible to induce the members to vote against the war. And only at the last minute, after the Turks were already on the march, did Diet finally support the Pope's request. Meanwhile, the Turks had begun to move. In May of 1683, they paused to wait reinforcements in Belgrade. Estimates of the total number of men in the Turkish forces range from 160,000 to 300,000. That's the only the number of soldiers. It doesn't include the enormous supply train for the army and all the men associated with that. On July 14th, they began pulling up before the walls of Vienna, pausing briefly to completely massacre the 4,000 inhabitants of a town six miles away. As the Turks neared the city, Louis XIV took advantage of this dire situation to attack the Netherlands, which at that time were part of the Holy Roman Empire. It was this kind of behavior that earned him the contemporary title of, quote, the most Christian Turk, the most Christian ravager of Christendom, the most Christian barbarian who had perpetrated on Christians outrages of which his infidel allies would have been ashamed, close quote. In the meanwhile, Emperor Leopold had retreated from Vienna, taking 8,000 of the residents to Linz, leaving only 5,000 citizens and a garrison of 11,000 soldiers. The city's defenses were still incomplete as the Turks began to leisurely surround the city and set up camp. The traditional arrow, bearing a message demanding surrender and conversion to Islam, was shot into the city, but the defenders didn't bother to reply, so the siege began. The Turks shot poisoned arrows at the defenders and trained what cannon they had at the walls, but the artillery was inadequate for the task, so on the 20th of July, the Turks began mining under the walls, filling the tunnels with gunpowder and setting off the charges. The Viennese, who by this time were suffering from severe dysentery, managed to bar the resulting gaps and keep the Turks out, but it was only a question of time until the Turks succeeded in completely breaching the walls. Outside the walls, life for the besiegers was pleasant and comfortable. Kair Mustafa's immense tents had gardens with fountains, baths with, bathrooms with scented baths and soaps, sumptuous beds, rich carpets, and a menagerie including rabbits, birds, and even an ostrich. It also included his harem and scores of black eunuchs to keep them in order. Back in Poland, Jan Sobieski was gathering his troops. Before leaving his kingdom, Sobieski wrote to the Calvinist leader of Hungary, who had aligned himself with the sultan, and informed the Hungarian leader that if he tried to take advantage of the situation and burnt so much as one straw, either in the territories of his allies or anywhere in the territories of the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that he, Jan Sobieski, would go and burn him and all his family in his house. The warning was sufficient to keep his unguarded kingdom safe in his absence. On the Feast of the Assumption, August 15, 1683, Jan Sobieski, at the head of some 2,000 winged hussars and leading some 23,000 other troops, began the forced marches to Vienna from the shrine of Our Lady of Shestoa. At that time, the Polish-Lithuanian winged hussars were the most elite cavalrymen in the world. They were called wing because they wore wings. They were attached to their backs. They're made out of wood frame, and they had eagle feathers attached to them. 
The wings gave a fearful appearance and made a frightening sound, both of which terrified the enemy and spooked their horses as the winged hussars descended upon them. Besides that, over their armor, they wore the skin of a leopard, a tiger, a wolf, or other animal over one shoulder, which had also spooked the enemy horses and the men. They carried a 17 to 20 foot long hollowed out lance. It was designed to shatter on impact with anything solid. Attached to the tip of the lance was a long pennant. Besides the lance, they carried two kinds of swords, one under each leg, one for piercing, and one for chopping, a war hammer, and a pair of pistols that were holstered over the horse withers. Their mounts, which are a remarkable Polish breed of cavalry horse, were capable of traveling 70 miles a day over a period of several days. And this is with guys bearing arms and in armor. If you're a horseman, you know how remarkable that is. Typically in battle, the hussars were used as shock troops. So they were held back until a decisive moment was at hand. When they were called up, they customarily sang a Polish hymn to the Mother of God, the most ancient national hymn in the world, national anthem in the world, the Vogelrodzica. Here's an English translation of it. Mother of God, virgin by God, glorified Mary. From thy son, the Lord, chosen Mary, obtained for us, sent to us, Kyrie eleison. For the sake of thy baptist, O son of God, hear the voices, fulfill man's thoughts. Hear the prayer which we offer. Deign to give us what we ask for. On earth, a stay with God. After a life, a sojourn in paradise. Kyrie eleison. So they'd be singing the hymn and line themselves up knee to knee at about 100 yards from the enemy and begin their charge, moving on to flat-out gallop at about 50 or 60 yards with their lances lowered alongside their horses' heads. The whole effect of this line of winged warriors singing this hymn, then descending upon the enemy at full tilt, all these six- to eight-foot-long pennants swirling, uh, fluttering, flapping in the breeze at the end of those 20-foot lances, all these leopard wolfskins uh, flapping around. The whole effect is absolutely terrifying. So, on August 15th, Sobieski, with the Hussars and the Polish troops, left Shedstoa. On September 4th, the Turks exploded a huge mine under part of the Wall of Vienna, but the defenders managed to stop up the the gap with boards and sandbags. On September 5th, the Polish relief force reached the Danube, and on the 8th of September, the whole relieving army assembled together on the Danube about 30 miles from Vienna. Besides the Polish troops, there were Austrian troops, as well as Germans that had come from Saxony, Swabia, Francona, and Bavaria, some 60,000 soldiers all told. Before they had a great council of war, Blessed Marco said Mass, and their server was King Jan Sobieski. The commander of the imperial forces placed himself under the command of Sobieski. Blessed Marco participated in the war councils as the emperor's representative. He assisted that it was necessary first to repent of the offenses given to God and implore his mercy and ask for his help, and then attack the Turks gathered around Vienna. And he prophesied, quote, the Turk will be vanquished, and he will leave us all his bags and baggage. Close quote. It was the last possible moment on the evening of September 11th that Jan Sobieski, leading his force of Catholic soldiers, arrived at a hill called the Kallenberg. It, it look, overlooks Vienna from the north. Surveying the situation, he was unimpressed with the enemy fortifications. As he wrote to his wife that night, quote, the general of an army who has neither thought of entrenching himself nor of concentrating his forces, but lies encamped as if we were hundreds of miles away from him, is predestined to be beaten. Close quote. In town, the defenders were on their last legs, starving, sick, broken walls. The situation was very grim. And then in the early mo- hours of the morning, September 12th, some bakers in Vienna, making bread with what very little flour still remained, heard noise underground. The Turks had placed a massive charge of gunpowder to be set off right under the walls, a charge that would have thrown the city wide open. The bakers alerted the defenders, who, after searching for hours, finally found the tunnel. When Austrian mole crawled in and pulled the fuses out, the burning fuses, literally burning up to the charges, and he's crawling around in there, pulling the fuses out at the last possible moment. September 12th was a Sunday. 
Up on the Kallenberg Hill, in the wee hours of the morning, Blessed Marcos celebrated Mass for the Army of the Holy League with Jan Sobieski as his server. After Mass, Blessed Marco gave a short and passionate speech to the Army, implored the divine assistance, and blessed the troops with his crucifix. Sobieski addressed the troops, We are the bulwark of Christianity against the arms of the Ottomans. It is necessary to defend the cause of God and to preserve the Western Empire. We must either conquer or die nobly in this just cause. Your king fights at the head of you to have a share both in your glory and your danger. Be confident that the God of battles whose cause we defend will undoubtedly fight for us. The troops began the four-hour descent on the mountainside. At 4 a.m., the Ottomans attacked. The Austrians moved forward on the left. The Germans pressed ahead in the center with the Polish on the right. Suddenly, Mustafa was no longer the attacker, but the defender, and on two fronts, one from the relieving force coming down the Kallenberg and the other from the Vienna defenders. Mustafa left some of his elite troops facing Vienna, then he galloped off to fight Sobieski's troops as they came down the mountain. During the battle, Blessed Marco galloped fiercely from one side of the lines to the other, crucifix in his hand, blessing and encouraging the fighters. Every time the Turks attacked, he would hold up his crucifix to them and say, Ece crucium domini, fugite partis adversae. It's from the exorcism, and it means, Behold the cross of the Lord, flee all you opponents. At about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, after watching the ongoing battle from the hills for all day, Sobieski stood in his stirrups, drew his sword, and charged down the hill, leading the largest cavalry charge in history. Sobieski was at the head of a spearhead of 2,000 winged hussars with four other cavalry groups behind, three Polish and one Austrian-German, a total of over 20,000 horsemen. The remaining Vienna garrison sallied out of the defenses and joined in the assault from the other direction. The Turks broke and fled in a stampede. They, they head towards Hungary, leaving everything behind them. All the booty seized in their campaign, as well as the entire camp. Tents, weapons, battle standards, provisions, herds, and slaves. After the battle, Sobieski prostrated himself with outstretched arms and declared it was God's cause that he was fighting for and attributed the victory to God alone. The Turks lost at least 15,000 men, dead and wounded in the fighting, and all their cannon and at least 5,000 men were captured. The Holy League lost approximately 4,500 dead and wounded. The day after the battle, Sobieski wrote to his wife, quote, Praise be our Lord God forever for granting our nation such a victory and such glory as was never heard of in all times past. The whole camp of the enemy, with their artillery and untold treasure, has fallen into our hands. They are now retreating in great confusion, and the approaches to the town, the camp, and the open fields are covered with their corpses. The camels and other beasts of burden, the cattle and the sheep belonging to the enemy were also captured. Parenthetical note, this in itself was an absolutely immense fortune. There were some 20,000 Anatolian buffalo they used as draft draft animals, Uh, 20,000 head of cattle, 20,000 camels, 20,000 mules, and 10,000 sheep and goats captured. Sobieski. What they left behind in powder and ammunition alone is worth a million. The Grand Vizier lost all his rich treasure and barely escaped on horseback with nothing but the coat on his back. His tent is so large it might have contained within its circumference the city of Warsaw. The standard that the Grand Vizier always had carried before him with great ceremony fell into my hands, along with the Mohammedan banner presented to him by the Sultan for this campaign, which I sent to the Holy Father in Rome, along with the green battle flag of Mohammed uh, Sobieski sent the Pope a message. He's paraphrasing Julius Caesar. Uh, He said, Veni, vidi, Deus ficit. I came, I saw, God conquered. Sobieski. There are quantities of the most beautiful gold-mounted sabers and other rare Turkish accoutrements to be seen in our army. The coming on of night prevented us from continuing the pursuit. I estimate the number of the besieging army at 300,000, not counting the Tartars. There must have been at least 100,000 tents, and from these, each of the conquerors takes away what he likes. The townspeople, too, are rushing out to get their share. I believe it will take them eight days to gather in all the booty. 
Among other riches, there were 100,000 sacks of grain and 10,000 sacks of tur- Turkish coffee. They cut down with their sabers a number of Austrian people, women folk especially, whom they had taken captive, but they could not carry away with them in their hasty flight. But many of them can be healed of their wounds. Elsewhere, we read there were 30,000 Christian prisoners liberated, of whom 500 were children who were to be sent as slaves to the sultan. Sobieski. Early this morning, I went into town and found that it could not have held out five days longer. Never have the eyes of men beheld so great damage done in so brief a time. Great masses of stone and rock have been broken up and tossed about in heaps by the enemy's mines, and the imperial castles riddled with holes and ruined by their cannonballs. This morning, the governor of Vienna, accompanied by a great crowd of people, came out to greet me, all kissing and petting me and calling me their savior. Later, I visited two churches where, again, I found crowds of people who tried to kiss my hands and even my feet and clothing. Most of them had to content themselves with touching my coat. All around, one heard them crying, Let us through to kiss the valiant hand. Together they lifted up a shout of joy. I begged the German officers to forbid this, but in spite of them, a great crowd shouted aloud, Long live the king. A parenthetical note, the Emperor Leopold, displeased that Jan Sobieski should have all the glory, condescended to visit and thank the Polish king, but treated Sobieski's son and the Polish commanders with extreme and haughty coldness, and in an outright insult, refused to review the hussars who had so gallantly destroyed the Turkish battle line. Sobieski. There is a huge pile of captured flags and tents. In short, the enemy has departed with nothing whatever but his life. Let Christendom rejoice and thank the Lord our God that he has not permitted the heathen to hold us up to scorn and derision and to upbraid us with their blasphemous Mohammedan proverb, Christians, where is your God? Close quote. In order to commemorate this great victory over the Muslims, Blessed Innocent XI ordered that the Feast of the Holy Name of Mary be celebrated every year on the 12th of September. Besides the Feast of the Holy Name of Mary, there are a few other things which ought to remind us of this glorious victory. As one story goes, after the battle, one enterprising man opened the first coffee house in Vienna using the 10,000 bags of Turkish coffee. That's certainly true. But because the coffee was so bitter, the story goes that Blessed Marco added milk and honey to sweeten it which is where it got the name cappuccino, after the brownish color of the habit of the capuchin. What is far more certain is the development of another common article of food. Cardinal Sarajeva Martins, he's the prefect for the Congregation for the Cause of Saints, explains, quote, It seems historically clear that the invention of the cornetto is more related to the liberation of Vienna than the cappuccino. It's said that during the siege, as some Viennese bakers were preparing rolls during the night from the little flour they had left, they heard the noise of Turkish sappers tunneling to set mines. They immediately raised the alarm, and the threat was averted. And they were therefore given the imperial privilege of molding their cornetti in the shape of the half moon. The cappuccino was then combined with the cornetto, perhaps in reference to Blessed Marco di Avano. Close quote. So the cornetto was first made in commemoration of this great victory. Here in the States, of course, we don't usually call this roll a cornetto. We usually refer to it by the French word, which is a croissant which is, of course, baked in the shape of a crescent, the symbol of the Turk. We got the French name because um, um, Marie Antoinette brought it from Vienna. The Polish bakers didn't want to be outdone by the Austrian bakers, so they commemorated the vi- victory with a roll in the shape of Sobieski's stirrup. The Polish word for stirrup is bugle, and this is the birth of the bagel, celebrating the great victory of uh, Christian victory, although nowadays this is hotly contested by Polish Jews. In 1690, the astronomer Ioannis Hevelius created a constellation, Scutum Sobieskianum, that's Sobieski's shield. It's now commonly known as Scutum, in commemoration of the great Sobieski, who was still alive when the constellation was named. The great king and faithful Catholic warrior died in 1696 and is interred in a magnificent tomb in the cathedral in Krakow. What became of Kar Mustafa? Having fled from Vienna to Belgrade, he ordered the execution of many senior officers, including one who was the brother of the favorite wife of the sultan. On Christmas Day in 1683, messengers from the sultan ordered him to hand over his seals of office of Grand Vizier. Having handed over the seals of his authority, he asked, Am I to die? When being informed that it was the case, he said, As Allah pleases. He then placed the silken bowstring around his own neck. Several men pulled it tight till he was duly strangled. 
His head was struck off, put in a velvet bag, carried to Istanbul, and presented to the sultan. The Ottomans fought on for another 16 years, losing control of Hungary and Transylvania in the process, before finally giving up on their designs for European expansion. The Battle of Vienna marks the end of the Ottoman expansion into Europe. But it hasn't marked the end of the Islamic expansion into Europe. Why can the Muslims take over Europe? Why can they now do what they could not do hundreds of years ago? Why? Because the Catholic people have lost the faith. Without the faith, Europe cannot be defended. Without the faith, there can be no Jan Sobieski's. <laughs>